Let's chat a bit about freeloading. There are a number of elements that have to be met before a person can be accused of being a freeloader. And the first element is that you have to, you know, it, let's, let's just take me as an example. Somebody's accusing me of being a freeloader. Well, first of all, I would have had to agree that I wanted the same outcome. So that's the first element, uh, that I want the same thing to happen and kind of in the same way, uh, the same solution. And then secondly, I would have to have agreed that I wanted this thing to be brought about in the same fashion. So if I say, well, yeah, I think it would be nice to be able to have something to sit on, and I agree to that, and then somebody else says, hey, why don't we just kill some people and throw them on the ground, and then you can sit on them. Well, I didn't agree to that method of me having something to sit on. So then if I, yeah, that 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 would not be acceptable. That That wouldn't be an element. It would have to be something that I agreed upon the way of achieving it. Next, we must uh, personally agree to do something to help achieve those goals. So if I agree that I want a place to sit and people say, hey, how about a chair? And I say, a chair is a great idea. And they say, how about a golden chair? A chair made of gold. And I say, I don't really think we need one that nice. And then everybody else goes along and builds a chair made of gold. And they make a bunch of chairs made of gold. And they put it around the area in the meeting room where everybody gets together. Everybody in the, the neighborhood gets together to chat about stuff. They put all these chairs in this meeting room. And then they say to me, hey, you're a freeloader. You, 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 know, you agreed we needed chairs. And you're not willing to pay for the golden chairs. So I didn't agree to that type. And I didn't agree to chip in a certain amount. Now, perhaps I would have said, hey... Provided you're asking me nicely, I will chip in a hundred bucks toward a chair. And so that kind of says that I expect two things. I expect that it won't be demanded of me. I expect that it will be asked nicely. And then the second thing would be the amount, which is a hundred dollars. So those would be two, two more kind of elements or, or parts of an element that would fit into this. Okay, and the next element would be if I participate in the use of the thing that was achieved when I didn't participate in making it happen. And so this, in this example of a meeting room, there's a, a meeting called and everybody comes into the meeting room and, and, and they say, hey, we all need to be seated because we don't want people standing that'll block the view. So everybody needs to take a seat. And the only chairs that are in there are golden chairs. Well, it's not what I wanted. I, I said gold is way too expensive to build chairs out of. I don't want that. I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to help. Um, but I'll, I'll come to your meeting and, I, and I'll just, I'm happy to stand. And they say, no, you need, to, you need to sit down. Well, in this case, I'm having to sit on their golden chair. And so the moment that my butt sits on the chair, I can't then be accused of being a freeloader. I didn't agree to the golden chair. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't an agreement. Now, people will say there are certain implicit agreements that communities, that, that social structures uh, social groups make that it's just kind of understood that in order to be part of this group, you have to blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm saying that is not legitimate. That's that's bad thinking. That's, that's very dangerous. Um, it's against people's personal autonomy. That's just plain old wrong, in my opinion. Do you agree with that? Do you agree or do you think that as long as the majority of the group, the social group, whether it's uh, 3,000 miles wide and 2,000 miles high with 300 million people, or if it's a little tiny community that's a square mile, uh, regardless of the number of people, if the majority says that a certain thing should happen, should everybody then be expected to jump in and help procure that thing or help bring it about? And then if the person doesn't jump in and help, can they really be accused of being a freeloader? Now, here is what I think a freeloader is. A freeloader is somebody who would meet all of those elements. So if people say, hey, we need to have chairs in the, the meeting room. And I say, hey, you know what, that's a good idea. I agree. And then they said, well, we can get them for, you know, 100 bucks each or we can get the gold ones for $10,000 each. And I say, let's do the $100 ones. And other people talk and they go, you know what, we'll agree to 150. And I say, you know what, fine, I'll do 150. 
And everybody agrees to that 150. We all chip in 150. And then we get the chairs. Now, let's say that I am the one person who didn't chip in the 150, even though I made a non-written but a verbal commitment, a contract, an agreement to put in 150. If I don't do that, now I am guilty of freeloading if I use those chairs. Now I'm guilty because I, I violated a contract. But you can't just suppose that I should have said yes or I should have wanted a chair and then accuse me of being a freeloader. That doesn't cut it intellectually. And this line of thinking, this is coming about because I am a little bit over halfway through a book that's really making me think. Uh, the Righteous Mind. I might even end up doing a review on it at some point. Uh, it started out the first chapter or so. I couldn't find any bias, and almost everything is biased. What I put out, my content, it's biased. I have certain subjective values, and it shows. And almost every author who I read, it's very obvious what their bias is. And this one, the first little bit, there wasn't much bias. And then as time went on, I could tell that there were certain biases. The author believed that the greatest good for the greatest number was a positive thing. The author thinks that uh, whatever helps the human species continue is a good thing, helping, the, helping us have offspring that will populate the earth and keep humans on top or wherever it is we are. Uh, he, he thinks that's a good thing. However, as he went through the book, I, I noticed the bias, and, and he, he said that he is a, a professor, uh, a liberal, uh, progressive kind of person, and I, I am not a progressive. I'm also not a conservative, definitely not either of those. And the only other option, if you're not a left or a right, the only other option is not being in the middle. That's a that's a false thing. You could be in the middle, you could be a moderate, or you could be in a whole nother room. You could be in a whole nother room, and that's where I am. I'm a principled, uh, libertarian-leaning humanitarian. Uh, some people call it voluntarism. So from my perspective, looking at his perspective, there were some things with which I could not agree. Uh, however, there were a lot of things he said that I thought, you know what, I need to, I need to think about this some more. And one of the things that he mentioned was the difference, and he didn't use the term individualism and collectivism, but it's it's essentially what he meant. And there's this idea that the group is more important than the individuals, the individual individuals who are in the group. And this is the, the classic uh, collectivism versus individualism thing. And it really made me think that I come from a, a worldview that it's just so bloody obvious to me that personal autonomy, personal individual liberty, freedom, uh, individual rights to do stuff. I know there's no such thing as rights, but you know what I'm saying. I, I think the individual has the highest claim to everything in the world, not the group. So the group may not violate the individual's rights for the sake of the, the group. I, I strongly believe this. And it's, it's what I've believed for many, many years. And I, this perspective that the author was bringing up is that in some societies, that's very common. And in certain times in history, that's very common. And then there are many other societies and people and worldviews who are just the opposite. And they can't even fathom how a person could think that they are better than the group. Like, wait a minute, you want to have the thing you want happen and that's you're going to put that ahead of the, all the rest of us? Unbelievably immoral, unethical, horrible. Why don't you make the righteous choice? And then meanwhile, here I am saying, I, I can't believe that you would take away my right to do what it is that I want to do and, and you would, would not allow me to do this. And, and would make me fall in line with this, this glob of soup, this group that doesn't have individual parts. It's all just one mishmash part. How, how horrible, how unrighteous. I want to do the righteous thing. And it, the book is just really making me think. Uh, I'm going to be very interested to finish it. And then he has excellent summaries at the end of each chapter. I'm going to listen to each of those and perhaps do another uh, talk uh, another, uh, I don't know, YouTube uh, video just on that uh, because it's a very interesting concept and interesting book. 
But to start out with, uh, let me know if you think that I'm on track with this this idea of a freeloader, who has been a freeloader and who isn't. Uh, let me know if what I've said so far makes sense, and then I will toss out another uh, personal example situation that I am in. My wife and I, a couple years ago, bought a, a small ranch out in the middle of nowhere in the Rocky Mountains, and you take a, a paved road, and in six, seven miles, the paved road ends state maintenance, and it turns into county maintenance, and it continues another seven or eight miles as a county paved road. And then you make a turn, and you go about 15 more minutes on two different dirt roads. They're both county maintained. And then you finally get back to the rural, rural little road. There, uh, my wife and I and the couple who live next door. And then about two miles further down, there's another uh, uh, family, kind of extended family, uh, two homes there. That's it on our road. It's over four miles long, four or five miles long. And so there are essentially three, four families on this road in the winter. And we have nasty winters. The snow is three, four, five, six feet deep. Wind blows 20, 30, 40 miles an hour. I think our fastest ever was 53, uh, excluding those little uh, dust devil thingies, uh, but just a maintained gusty kind of wind. Maintained and gusty, that's kind of the opposite, huh? But you know what I'm saying, kind of a solid solid wind with occasional gusts. Uh, it's, it's, it's nasty out here. And the county maintains the road. They plow it. They do the snow plowing. And it costs, I'm guessing, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 for them to plow the road. And it just, it happens. I haven't asked them to. I haven't participated in anything, any asking, telling, demanding, anything like that. The government just does its thing and it does this. It doesn't make sense. Uh, if they were going to come to each of us families and say, hey, you each need to toss in a hundred grand a year to pay for us to do the road, I would, my wife and I would say, no, we're not going to spend that. We have snow machines. We'll park our cars further out and take our snow machines in. So am I a freeloader? I, I use the road, um, but I don't really have any options. The, the road is the one road, and it has a right-of-way on each side. I could snow machine on that, uh, but those banks are built up by the snow plows to be solid. They leave a little flat spot for snow machines there. If I go much further, then I'm on the neighbor's ranch, and I haven't asked him for permission to, to be on his ranch. So I could ask him, and that would get me out to one more road, but then I would go through a lot of other private properties. Over the years, there's become this monopoly on the ownership of roads. Government has just claimed rights to do all roads. And it's kind of worked out well for everyone, and nobody's raised a fuss. Or if they have, they've been quashed. I'm not raising a fuss. Should I be? Does that make me a hypocrite? Does it make me a freeloader? Should I refuse to go anywhere if it's on a government road? If it's a government-maintained road, I ain't driving on it. And I think the nearest place would be Denver or Salt Lake City or something like that. They might have some toll roads that are privately owned, uh, but that would be the closest private road that I could go to other than some little subdivision. doesn't seem like I should be expected just because some people came in and commandeered some property and built some roads on them. I shouldn't be appreciative or bound not to use them, should I? Am I thinking incorrectly here? I mean, think about it from a, a really rational, from a reals standpoint, not a feels, but from a reals standpoint. What's a person to do? What's a person to do if the government comes in, commandeers a resource, a, a forest, a road, a lake, a river, and then sets up rules for how you use it. They claim to be the manager of it, and they set up the rules. Do you just go along with them? Do you go along with them as little as you have to to still get stuff done? I don't know where that line is. This goes back to the old question I heard years ago about uh, a, a Nazi concentration camp, and the one of the guards has a little pity and tosses a, a rind of bread on the ground at a prisoner's foot so they can have something to eat, does the prisoner say, no, that bread was purchased with dirty Nazi money. 
I am not going to participate in this stolen money because the Nazis taxed to get the money. I'm not going to participate in this dirty money and I'm not going to eat the bread. Instead, I'm going to die in a couple hours. Is that what's to be expected? Now, there's a far cry between, I was going to say, between dying from starvation and not using roads, but I use roads to go out and do my job to make money, and I and I use roads to go get food and to I don't know, recreate, take my trash to the government dump, all these things. How much participation should a person have in the collective? The collective has, has put together this whole thing, or the government has, and then claimed it was the collective. A am I at fault for, for driving on roads? For using cell phone towers that have government uh, FCC uh, rules that these cell towers have to abide by? Should I say if government has touched anything even in the slightest, I can't touch it morally? Yeah, I mean, my first argument would be, well, that would cripple me. That would make things really tough. Well, I think a Stoic might say, well, yeah, we never promised life was going to be easy. Just do what's right. If it, is it right to do government stuff? No. Then quit doing it. Yeah, you might starve to death, but just quit doing government stuff. I don't know if I'm that hardcore. Should I be? Am I weak if I'm, if I'm not standing firm? If I use anything that the government has anything to do with? Is that okay? What do you think? 